Hi there and welcome to another update on the geologic situation taking place in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is Saturday, July 6th. It is about 7 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, 1 p.m. over there in Iceland. And thanks for joining me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as many of you know, I just got back from a trip in Europe on the Rhine River with my wife and wanted to do an update while we were out doing that, but the Wi-Fi signal on the boat was just, it was a little uh, glitchy and just wasn't going to work well. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to do uh, an update then. So I thought I'd put one together today and uh, just update you as well as myself on just some of the things that have been going on there over the past <clears throat> few weeks or so. So let's go ahead and get right to it. As many of you likely know, the eruption that started May 29th ended a few weeks ago. Here's a webcam view of the cone, the last vent that was erupting in the area. And so you can see it is now uh, inactive and stagnant and just uh, an impressive feature on the landscape, if anything else. Um, nevertheless, <clears throat> the uplift in the region continues, and so magma is continuing to pool and inflate into the crust beneath this region, and so we do expect there to be another eruption or an intrusion in the coming weeks and maybe months or so. Um, let's go to the Met Office update. <clears throat> And we'll start with that, go through some of the data, and then at the end of this update, I'll circle back to a new paper that's come out over the past few days. So um, the last Met Office update, this is from yesterday, July 5th. It does not appear that magma inflow into Svart Singi has decreased. So all the, the data that they're seeing suggests that magma is continuing to rise and pool uh, underneath the power plant region, and that's what's feeding these eruptions we've been having since last December. And so uh, the seismic activity is low. We'll look at that here in a second. But the the GPS or land uh, ground deformation is still continuing. Um, <clears throat> and let me work, walk you through uh, this paragraph, and then we'll we'll work our way through this this big graph here. So <clears throat> they did some mod. Let me just I guess I'll summarize it instead of reading it to you. They basically um, used a model to look at the periods of time between eruptions. So looking at how much magma was intruding into this storage zone between eruptive events. Um, and then what they found when they did that was that the amount of magma coming into the system has more or less been the same. It's around four to six cubic meters per second. And so uh, what we've seen since December is a fairly you know, consistent supply of magma from the subsurface. So let me walk you through this here as best I can. Um, so here's months of the year at the bottom from October over here, uh, just getting into July, I suppose, at the far right. <clears throat> and then you'll see these gray bars um, running up and down the page vertically. These are periods where there was eruptions or there was intrusions of magma. And so <clears throat> Excuse me, this is when the magma was actually moving through the system. But mo what's most important here, what they're modeling, is a period of time between eruptions when the system is basically closed, the lid is on, no magma is leaving the system, and they're able to quantify um, or estimate how much magma influx is coming into the system. And what you can see is since uh, the December eruption, uh, that started December 18th, that the amount of magma coming in, looking at the green, the yellow, the blue, the red, this kind of brown orange color, and this red over here, has pretty much stayed the same. I mean, within about you know four to five to six uh, cubic meters per second. So that suggests that the magma <clears throat> influx is is largely unchanged over that period of time, which is pretty interesting. Um, the other interesting they had in one of their most recent updates as well was uh, another INSAR interferogram. So this just nicely shows this bullseye pattern here. Here's a good end of it. Here's the power plant area right here. Um, and this bullseye pattern here nicely shows the amount of uplift. This is about three to four centimeters uh, during this period of time. So from June 13th to June 25th, they flew over the area um, and got the data and then they fly over it again and it's able to compute the difference in elevation between those two dates. Um, with the satellite data. So that nicely shows the change in um, change in 
ground position or elevation over that time. So all of the signs are pointing to inflation continuing. Uh, this will obviously reach some head later on when we actually have uh, either an eruption or an intrusion. If we look at the GPS data, and we'll just go to the Svart Sengi station, here's the May 29th eruption, and then here's what the data shows since that time. And you can see what we did initially have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a little bit of a deflationary trend with the ground elevation dropping uh, since about you know three or four days after that eruption began we've had a fairly steady inflationary trend with the ground rising over time now the big question of course is where where does this go what happens when this gets to the elevation that was criti the critical elevation we reached here that triggered this eruption um, what we've seen in the past of course is that um, each subsequent inflationary trend uh, exceeds this elevation, the elevation, the highest elevation of the preceding uh, ele uh, inflationary trend. So what we would expect then is that this thing is going to continue and go past this point, probably up to 80 or beyond 80 uh, millimeters on this graph here, before we see any sort of um, any sort of activity, whether that's a, an eruption or an intrusion. So, uh, so the GPS data will continue to be probably our best data to watch and just keep an eye on over the next few weeks and maybe months. We'll have to see and see what happens with this trend of data, how far this keeps going. On the earthquake front, um, not a lot to report here, and we wouldn't expect there to be much in the way of earthquakes now um, because the this magma system has space to the magma has space to intrude and occupy uh, without necessitating <clears throat> breaking rock and generating earthquakes and so I wouldn't expect there to be much of a um, of a real signal from the earthquake data until we get uh, much further along or if we get to a point where the magma seems to be moving in a different direction um, and not occupying the same system that's been established, that would be uh, accompanied by earthquake data as well. As that magma is pushing its way through the fractures and the open spaces in the rock, it's going to need to break that rock, widen it, um, and that would generate earthquakes. And so uh, not much we can see here on the earthquakes, pretty quiet in this area over the last 24 hours. Even looking back uh, a week or so, not much going on either there. So. So not much to report from the earthquake front. GPS data still showing inflation. Um, and we'll see where this gets to a head as we move forward. So uh, so that's the, a quick update for today. And then I wanted to walk folks through. Uh, Amanda Joe told me there were folks that wanted to know what my take was on this paper that just came out. So Val Troll is a, a geology professor, I think, in Sweden and a, a geochemist, I think, by training, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there's a Professor Thordersen's name on the paper as well. Uh, and so a couple folks we might be familiar with. But they just put out a paper within the last month that looks at the geochemistry of the rocks, of, of the magma, of the lava, coming out of the Svartsengi system and comparing it also to the Fagordalsfeld system. So basically all these eruptions that have taken place since 2021, looking at the geochemistry, looking a little bit at the, the, the earthquake, uh, what we call seismic tomography, so what the earthquakes can tell us about uh, the plumbing system, and their, their um, conclusion or suggestion from this paper is that it seems to look like the Fagordalsfeld eruptions and the more recent ones this past year on the Sudnukur uh, trend that they're related to each other that they're coming from a, a shared magma storage zone and so let me just kind of walk you through that and if you're not familiar with how these scientific papers work um, you know even though they are kind of written in a technical way uh, dive into them just t take a stab at trying to understand them usually they're they're up front there's an abstract which is a very brief summary of the whole the whole thing so if you want to just you know get a good glimpse of what the paper is trying to convey which is in just a paragraph or so that's a good place to start uh, then there's usually an introductory section that kind of sets the stage the background the context the setting so here's volcanism on the Reykjanes Peninsula a little section there they talk about the three eruptions from 2021 to 2023 of the Fagordalsfjell uh, system. Then they 
they characterize and discuss these more recent eruptions that began in December of 2023. Nice graphic here uh, showing the different, what we call the different systems, although we're not sure if that's the right way to approach it, but you know, just a graphic here, a map showing where these occurred. Um, and then there's kind of like, what, what, what was their goals? What were they trying to do uh, with the study? So purpose and aim of study, um, a little summary there of the eruptive periods on the Reykjanes Peninsula. We've looked at something like that before. Um, and then they typically will look at their uh, methods and results, like what did they do and what were the results. And then after they, the results are, you know, um, objective, right? There's no interpretation there, but then they'll get into actually coming up with some interpretations uh, based on some of those results. So. Uh, so they took samples of the, I'll come back to this in a second. Let's get down to, I am no geochemist, by the way. So they took samples of the rocks or lava samples, fresh samples of lava from all these previous eruptions, uh, and then looked at specific elements, compositions of different elements within those lava samples, and then plot them up. So on the bottom scale here, you have time, uh, starting with the, the 2021 eruption in yellow, and all the Fagradalsfjall eruptions are in yellow, <coughs> yeah, excuse me, yellow, green, and blue. So this is the 2022 eruption, 2023, and then the Sunukur one is down here. And then so plotting all these up um, with respect to magnesium, chromium, different elements here that are uh, informative, and then showing what that data looks like. And essentially, again, I'm no geochemist, looking at all these, um, you can see that some of their ratios stay the same. Others change and evolve a little bit over time, uh, but that's to be expected because we, if it's a shared magma system, you might be getting uh, crystals forming and, and the, the chemistry is never exactly the same, but you can see that that's a nice continuum and those trends there. And uh, here's some photo micrographs showing some of the crystals in the rocks. And all of that's to say that the, the and then they look at the, the seismic tomography as well um, that shows them where there's a zone down about 10 kilometers down in the crust that could represent the actual shared magma storage zone for both uh, the Fagradalsfjall and the Svartsengi or the Sunukur uh, systems. And so then, you know, taking all their data, then they come up with some interpretations. Um, and so that's the fun thing about science is uh, people can look at your, your methods, the way you did your study, how you sampled. Uh, they can look at your results. And then they can look at the interpretations as well. And so that's all grounds for discussion and, and learning together. So this is maybe the big takeaway here is this graphic here, which nicely shows uh, the big hotspot plume of magma coming um, from deep within the earth rising towards Iceland. So there's Iceland up near the surface. Uh, a little closer view over here, uh, diagram B here shows that magma coming up from deep levels in the hotspot, uh, but then flowing out. And so over here, this is the Reykjanes area here. So this is S and the F, that's the, the Svartsengi or Sunukur system and F is the Fagradalsfjall system. So just showing the big picture view a little bit closer. And then they have three different models here uh, showing, or scenarios I suppose, showing how this might look at depth. One where you've got the um, magma coming up uh, from in the mantle, accumulating right along the boundary between the crust and the mantle, and then feeding these systems from a deeper source. You can see these little tendrils coming up and feeding them uh, from a deeper source. This middle one here is a little different. It shows um, that the, the combined source is much more shallow, um, but there's lots of just regional small um, storage zones in the area. And then the third one kind of has a larger storage zone, a sh shared storage zone uh, that feeds these ones here as well. Um, and so pretty interesting. Um, I don't know, we probably don't have the resolution to really image and see some of these thin storage zones at depth. Not sure if that's true or not, but um, that might be one of the impediments to figuring that out a little bit. And um, 
you know, one of the questions that came up as I was looking at this was, well, why the shift? What? And they didn't address this, and this wasn't maybe part of their paper, but why, why did the Fagradalsfjeld area, why were was the storage zone feeding that area, establishing a plumbing system there for th the better part of three years? And then if it's a shared magma storage zone, why would it shift, create an entirely new um, storage zone over beneath the power plant uh, and close to the the Sunukur system. Um, so not quite sure about that there, but um, all in all, I mean, I, I, I didn't see anything that really egregious that stuck out to me in terms of their methods, uh, the approach that they took, um, and they're not saying definitively that it's a shared magma source. That's right here in the title. Um, they're just suggesting that possibly it's a single magma reservoir and it does look like a lot of the data does trend that way so it's quite possible that these er eight eruptions that we've had so far uh, in this region are related to a common magma storage body which has its own chemistry um, and is feeding these these eruptions in both these places during the, those periods of time so, um, so hopefully that's helpful if you have specific questions about the paper um, that I can try to answer. I'd be happy to do that. Um, but it's a nice little model, nice little synopsis of things that are going on there. So um, I'll make sure the link for the paper is in the description as well. If you want to read this on your own or print it out and look at it, uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, so moving forward, I will put together another update uh, maybe after a couple days if there's some more data. Uh, to look at some more information that's coming down the pipe. Uh, otherwise, look for some new videos from me, and hopefully here soon we'll be able to do another live stream. That would be great. And oh, also remember, I will be putting out a new, uh, if you're into the Geology 101 series, I'll put another one of those videos out in the next couple days as well. So thanks again for your time. I appreciate your support of the channel and all you do to keep our geology education machine humming along. And take care. We'll see you soon.